May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. May I first of all say thank you. It's a great delight to have the invitation to be with you this evening in this wonderful historic church and I'm really delighted to share this act of worship with you. So thank you for your welcome. It's a joy to be here. The first lesson may have been on the long side indeed, but it's also unforgettably vivid. The Queen of Sheba coming with all the Cecil B. DeMille splendor of an old style epic. The apes and the peacocks coming in ships from Tarshish and Ophir, the glory of King Solomon, the magnetic power, the drawing power of Solomon's splendor, but above all of Solomon's wisdom. The Queen of Sheba comes with questions to Solomon, and nothing is hidden from the king. He answers all her questions. I don't imagine that her questions were of the university challenge variety. What's the square root of minus 31? What's the capital of Bolivia? I imagine that the Queen of Sheba came with the sort of questions to which the Proverbs of Solomon might provide an answer. Questions about the nature of the human heart. Questions about how the contours and habits of the human heart reflect or fail to reflect the order and harmony of God's creation. Because when we turn to the book of Proverbs and indeed to other parts of the Old Testament that we refer to as wisdom literature, those are always the two themes. The mysteriousness of the human heart and the order and beauty of creation around and the difficulty of putting those together so often. The Queen of Sheba comes because that is an attractive thing to learn about. From the time of Solomon right up to the early modern period, those two mysteries, what's written in the human heart and what's written in the starry heavens, have set the agenda of thinkers, writers and poets. If you think somebody understands one or both of those things, then like the Queen of Sheba, you would really like to be in their company for a while. You'd like to be in the company of a great imaginative artist who understands the human heart and the world around. You'd like to be in the company of a truly great scientist who maps the starry heavens and uncovers the order of creation. It's an attractive picture and even stripped of the technicolor, one can still understand why the Queen of Sheba might want to come to Solomon and might be breathlessly amazed at what she hears. There was no more spirit in her. And then we turn to the New Testament lesson, and the picture is rather different. St. Paul has come to the cities of Asia Minor and northern Greece with his proclamation of Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. One might imagine that someone coming proclaiming wisdom would rather like King Solomon have a ready and willing audience. But Paul's reception is pretty uneven. It was, I think, the great Roman Catholic scholar Ronald Knox who invented a form of snakes and ladders based on the missionary journeys of St. Paul, showing just how uneven his career was. We hear in tonight's lesson about the unwelcoming reception he got. We hear of that unforgettable complaint made by his accusers. These are the men who have turned the world upside down. The message is heard not as one of harmony, insight and wisdom, 
but one of disruption and threat. People don't want to hear it. They don't find it attractive. And Paul and his companions are in danger of their lives throughout these chapters of the Acts of the Apostles. So what's happened to the idea of wisdom between the harmonious days of Solomon's glory and the sometimes ignominious and conflict-ridden career of St. Paul as he witnesses to wisdom? Not so much, I think, a question of what's happened in between as a question of the binocular vision we have to hold on to as we think about the Christian faith and what it means. Here, we say, is a wisdom, an insight and a truthfulness which corresponds to the deepest things in us. In a sense, the gospel of Jesus Christ and all that it brings to us is the most natural thing in the world. We were made to hear God's good news. We were made to love God as sons and daughters of the Eternal Father. We were made for fellowship in Christ and the Holy Spirit with God the Father. That, the ultimate ground of all wisdom, that is what something in us echoes to, responds to. And yet, somehow, with our other eye, we see just how odd we have made ourselves as human beings, just how strange, just how unnatural. We see just how far we've gone away from that vision of wisdom, how far we fail to understand what the human heart is really about, and how far we've failed to respond to the world around us with appropriate wonder and gratitude we realize that our problem is not only that we're unwise, we're unnatural. And the gospel of Jesus Christ comes to jolt us back into a recognition of who we really are as human beings and what the world is really like. The gospel comes to open our eyes to the truth of the heart within and the heavens above. And so strange is that truth, so habituated are we to seeing things askew and aslant, that it seems as if everything is upside down. What we thought was natural and obvious isn't. And the strange message of Jesus Christ is the natural and the obvious. We come to think that it's natural and obvious that we're made to struggle against each other to tread on one another's toes and to flourish at the expense of our neighbour. We're used to thinking that the way in which we use our knowledge of the world around is to squeeze the world dry for our own purposes. And if you're in any doubt about how deep those habits go, just cast a glance at the newspaper. Cast a glance at a world which is ravaged by open violence in places like Syria, and by the unspoken violence of injustice in so many places that keep so many people poor and hungry. Look at the crisis that affects our whole relation to our environment. No, the heart within and the heavens above are not seen by us with very much clarity or very much joy. And what seems to us so obvious and so natural has to be turned upside down. No, says the wisdom of God in Jesus Christ, no, we are not made to flourish at each other's expense. And we're not like a pile of starving people scrapping over a single bone. We are made to serve one another and to make one another more human, more real, more joyful. And no, we are not made to squeeze the world dry. We are made with the intelligence, the love, the artistic appreciation that allows us to absorb the beauty of the world as it is and use it wisely and temperately 
and justly. The world upside down. Our habits challenged and restored. What happens because of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus is that our eyes are opened but also our wills are renewed. Our energy, our capacity to act is strengthened, revolutionized by the gift of God's Christ-like Holy Spirit. And one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is wisdom. The wisdom of Solomon. That wisdom which sees the heart within and the heavens above for what they really are. Which restores us to our true place with one another and with creation in the presence of Almighty God. So we as a community of Christians are called to be wise in that way. Wise like Solomon, recognizing that like Paul, our wisdom will not always be terribly welcome to the world around us. We may not find ourselves stoned and carried out of the city as if dead like St. Paul, or executed by the sword of a Roman persecutor. But we certainly have to put up with the fact that quite a lot of people in our world will think we're anything but wise. Wisdom, shrewdness by the standards of the world is knowing how to operate the system of jostling up against one another and squeezing others and the environment dry. That's wisdom. It's the finger on the side of the nose kind of wisdom. It's knowing how to work things. So we will probably look naive or silly if we say that's not what God made human beings for, not what the world is for. But as St. Paul himself reminds us unforgettably in 1 Corinthians, God's foolishness is wiser than the wisdom of human beings. And that's where we belong. And the truth is that at the end of the day, what people expect from the Church of God is not, dare I say it, instructions, it's not theories, it's not answers to university challenge style questions. I believe what the world asks from the Church is, in fact, wisdom. People hope that there is a place somewhere in the world where they are understood for what they really are. They hope that sometimes without even noticing it, without even knowing it. They hope, inarticulately, deeply buried levels, they hope that the angry, competitive, quarrelsome, exploitative habits of the world are not the whole story. They are hungry for the wisdom of God. And we are there, by God's grace and gift, to show what that wisdom might mean. We're there to be wise. We may look at ourselves and, of course, even more look at our neighbours and wonder whether wisdom is the first thing that comes to mind when we think about them. And St. Paul is memorably rude about the congregation in Corinth when in 1 Corinthians he reminds them that not many of them were particularly wise or particularly important or particularly impressive. That must have gone down very well in Corinth. <laughs> Yet, wisdom is what we're called to. Wisdom is what we have to show. Wisdom, in Solomon's sense, of right relation. A right relation with one another, which is generous and mutual a right relation with the world around us, which is reverent and prudent. And that restoration to our proper place, as I said, with one another and with creation, is a restoration of our place before God. It comes mysteriously and all-powerfully through the act of God in Jesus Christ, which Paul proclaims in Thessalonica and Berea, and throughout the Eastern Mediterranean, 
in words which still ring in our ears in lands that Paul never knew or dreamed of. So as we look back on the heritage represented in a church like this, as we look back on what has been willed and bequeathed to us by believers who've walked before us in this place, perhaps we should try and recognize it as wisdom, as a right intuition, a right taste almost for the truth of God, the truth of ourselves as humans, the truth of the world around us, and ask how we help one another to grow in that kind of discernment, that gentle but firm turning upside down of the standards so often around us. A world which is topsy-turvy needs turning upside down. And as the great G.K. Chesterton once said, the truth of the matter is that as we look around at a world where trees appear to grow out of the soil, we have to remember that they're all actually hanging from the hand of God upside down. We ourselves are hanging by our feet from the mercy of God, dangling from the grace of God moment by moment. We depend absolutely on that. Now that's a turning upside down which brings some excitement and some joy. A reminder that when the gospel arrived in human history, it wasn't a boring and familiar bit of religious language. It was both the most natural and the most revolutionary thing that had ever come into the human world. It's still that today. It's our task, our privilege, and our joy to say that and to show it. And with God's grace and with any luck, the current equivalents of the Queen of Sheba may find there's no spirit left in them. The half was not told them. They'd never imagined that reality could be like this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.